a blessing to be here with you. This is my first time to New Zealand, and evidently this is my first time to this camp meeting. But it's always a privilege wherever I go to be with God's people. Amen? Amen. And so um, our time has been going because the enemy has been working against uh, the computer, but no matter. I was educated a long time ago never to be dependent upon PowerPoint. So we let the Holy Spirit be the power and I'll just do the pointing. Amen? Amen. So before we get into the Word of God this evening, as it is my tradition, I always love to encourage everyone to do two things. Number one, I'm asking you to please pray for yourself. It's my firm belief that every time the Word of God is open, that the Spirit of God is at hand to lead and direct us into all truth. And so I'm encouraging everyone to please prayerfully ask for the Spirit of God to be your guide, to be your instructor, and to open up your understanding that you might know exactly what it is that God desires for you to know and for you to submit your heart to at such a time as this. And please pray for myself as well that I'll be used by God as an instrument for His glory. So, as it is my tradition, I'm going to kneel and pray at this time, and I would like to invite you to kneel with me as well as we go before the throne of God. And I want to give everyone just 60 seconds to pray in your heart. And at this time, we're not praying for anything else other than for the Spirit of God to come and inhabit us. When you hear my voice, I'll be closing us in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord God of the universe, we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath rest. We thank you for bringing us all from different places here safely so that we might fellowship together in your presence. We thank you for the ministry of your holy angels that escorted us on our way as we came here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And it is our desire, Father, that as we gather together on these campgrounds, that we will not just find fellowship in speaking with one another, but we will find fellowship with you, with your Son, and with the Spirit of God. Please cleanse us of all of our sin. Wash us clean of our idols, our iniquity. We pray for the mind of Jesus Christ to be added unto us. We need your Holy Spirit, Lord. You've given us the promise that if our parents, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto their children, how much more would you, our Father, which is in heaven, give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask him? And so we're asking you, Lord, in faith, nothing wavering. Please lead and direct us into truth, that we might be sanctified and prepared for the second coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And for all this, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're going to Revelation chapter 6. Once again, we're opening our Bibles to the book of Revelation, and we're going to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. I'll say it one more time. Revelation chapter 6, and we are going to begin at verse 1. And when you're there with me, please just let me know by saying amen. Revelation Chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. If you're together with me in your Bibles, please let me know by saying amen. Amen. The Bible tells us here in Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. 
And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power is given unto them to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill with the sword, and that they should kill one another, rather. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And his rider had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And seest thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power is given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed like as they were should be fulfilled. And when he had opened the sixth seal, or rather I saw when he had opened the sixth seal, I beheld rather when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree, casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when they are rolled, to, rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath is come, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to... Stand Now, what we've just looked at in these 17 verses of Scripture, most of, you pro pro most of you, I would assume, are probably familiar with Revelations chapter 6. But what we've just looked at very quickly in a snapshot is the entire history of the Christian church. The entire history of the Christian church from the time that we entered the battlefield of the great controversy all the way till we see the conclusion of the great controversy, which is brought to reality by the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you following so far? We are looking at the entire history of the Christian church from the time they entered the battlefield of the great controversy all the way until we see the signs and the sun and the moon and the stars and all of these things that indicate the second coming of Jesus Christ is right before us. Now, I said that we're looking at the church entering the battlefield of the great controversy because under the, fir the first four seals, we see horses coming out. Open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, I want you to see what the Bible says concerning the symbol of the horse in the book of Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 31. Once again, we're looking at Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 31, and we're looking at the symbol of the horse as it is used in the Bible. In Proverbs 21 and verse 31, the Bible says the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but salvation is of the Lord. So the horse is a symbol of battle in the Bible. And here we see four horses coming out of the first four seals because we're looking at God's people entering the field of controversy, entering the battlefield of the great controversy. The first seal, we see a white horse coming out. Every time, every time we see a change in the color of the horse, it's a change in the nature or the character of the church. So, white horse, the church in its purity. This is the church, what they would say, under the apostolic era. This is the church after Pentecost. This is the church Filled with the Spirit of God in its purity, in its virgin state, so to say. Notice the Bible says that the rider has a bow in his hand. A bow and arrow is a weapon that's used for long-distance combat. So the gospel had far-reaching effects 
under the work that went forward under the first seal. The apostle Paul says that the gospel went to the then known world. It had far reaching effects. It went forth gloriously. But then when we see the second seal open up, we see that the color of the horse changes from white to red. Now, red in the Bible can be a symbol of blood. Red in the Bible can also stand as a symbol of sin. Most of us are familiar with that in the book of Isaiah. Just turn your Bible there quickly. Isaiah chapter one. We're looking at verse 18. Familiar scripture to all of us here in the room. Isaiah chapter one, 18th verse. The Bible says this concerning the color of red. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, I will make them like what? Wool. So red in the Bible can stand as a symbol of sin. Red in the Bible can stand as a symbol of bloodshed. And they are both accurate applications for the character of the church under the second seal. Why? Because under the second seal, the church was persecuted. Much blood was shed. We see the persecution of Emperor Diocletian against the Christian church took place during this time frame. From 303 A.D. all the way through 313 A.D., some of the fiercest persecution that the Christian church underwent was under that time period. As well, error started coming into the church. Apostasy started, uh, apostasy started slipping into the ranks of God's church. If you look in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you may remember that the apostle Paul speaking there said the mystery of iniquity doth already work. This is during the time period of his existence. So error already began to come into the Christian church, which now brings us to the third seal, which is the black horse. And we know that black in the Bible, that darkness in the Bible stands as a symbol of sin. We can see the writer has a pair of balances in his hand. Apostasy is now taking hold of the church. Those balances that are in the writer's hand, they are unbalanced balances. The Bible speaks of abominable balances in the book of, open your Bibles quickly with me, Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. If I'm moving kind of quickly through this information, it's because this is not what I'm trying to focus our minds on this evening, but I'm going through all of this so that we can have a good foundation as we go forward to look at something in greater depth this evening. Proverbs chapter 11, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1, look what the Bible says concerning balances. A false balance is an abomination, but a just weight is his delight. So abominable things began to enter into the church. Abominable practices began to enter into the Christian church. They allowed the errors of paganism and all these things to begin to seep into the church. But notice that there's a voice that comes from the midst of the four beasts. And if you look in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, don't read it right now, but I hope you will read it later. But in Revelation chapter 4, if you read from verse 1 on down, you'll notice that the Bible is giving a description of the throne of God. The throne of God is described in Revelation chapter 4. And you'll also notice that in Revelation chapter 4, four beasts are spoken of as holding up the throne of God. The one whom sits in the midst of the four beasts is God the Father himself. And so the voice that came from the midst of the four beasts is the voice that comes down from the throne of God. God is making a declaration as he sees abominable practices taking hold in the church. He says a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, but see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. In short, what God was saying is though men have brought corrupt practices into my church, though men have perverted judgment, Make sure that protection, he put his hand over his truth so that his truth would be available for generations to come, even ourselves. But now as we get to the fourth seal, we see a pale horse come out. The rider's name is death. Now, how does death come about? What is the origin of death? How does death originate? Everyone in here should know the answer to that one. Sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, correct? Romans 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is Death. So death comes about as a result of sin. So the writer's name was death. Can we not say that the writer's name was sin? Does the Bible speak of a man of sin? Yes. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we are told of the man of sin, the son of perdition. Perdition, brothers and sisters, is destruction. Perdition is what will come about as a result of 
hellfire. Notice the Bible says the writer's name is death and what follows with him? Hell. This is the development of the papacy that we're looking at under the fourth seal. Is it clear? And it says that this system would have power over the fourth part of the earth. They would kill with the sword and with hunger and death and with the beast of the earth. And did the papacy do just that? Yes. The papacy did just that. Destroyed the saints of the living God. Which brings us now to the fifth seal. Under the fifth seal, we see souls under the altar that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These souls that were under the altar that were crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? These souls were not living souls, but like righteous Abel, as the Bible speaks of how the blood of righteous Abel continues to cry from the ground to the Lord. God does not forget the cries of his saints, brothers and sisters. And so these souls were those that were martyred. They were the individuals that were martyred by the papal power that we see brought to view under the fourth seal. And they're saying, how long, O Lord, are you not going to avenge our blood on this system that persecuted us wrongfully, even unto the death? The Bible says that God responds by placing white robes on them. Robes in the Bible, garments in the Bible, what are they symbolic of? Character. White robes can be righteousness, but we can have on filthy garments, which are symbolic of us having sinful characters. Amen. So the garments in the Bible are a symbol of character. Why did God give them white robes? Because the papacy said that they were heretics. The papacy said that these people were blasphemers. They were sent to the grave under unjust titles, being said to be something that they were not. And God said, no, this is their true character. These were my saints. They were righteous. They stood for my truth. I'm placing white robes on them. Do you get the point so far? But he said to them, you have to rest for a little season until your fellow servants and your brethren that should be killed like as you were should be fulfilled. Letting us know that there are those that are coming in the near future that are going to be persecuted even unto the death like those martyrs did in times past. God is going to have martyrs in this age. God is going to have more martyrs in this age. Persecution is coming once again to the people of God, and it will be carried out by the very same entity that sent those people to graves once before. But we are told under the sixth seal, that there was a great earthquake. This great earthquake, most of you already know, was the earthquake of Lisbon. That happened in the year 1755. The sun became black as sackcloth appeared. The moon became as blood. The great dark day, that happened in the year 1780. And then the stars of heaven fell, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. When she is shaken of a mighty wind, now that one happened in the year 1833. And then the next thing the Bible speaks of are the events that are going to take place just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that most of you are familiar with many of these signs that we've just looked at right here, but I want you to take something into consideration right now. I know it's late. That's okay. Pray for the Spirit of God to keep your mind sharp right now. Amen? Because this is the reason that we came here. We came here to get into the Word of God. We came to commune with the Lord. Amen? And so, brothers and sisters, I want you to have something clear in your mind. All of these seals are in chronological order. Okay? When the first seal closes, immediately the second seal opens up. There's no lapse in time. When the second seal closes, immediately the third seal opens up. There's no lapse in time. Not a second goes before the third seal opens up. All of the seals are like that. Are you getting my point so far? Now, when we get to the sixth seal, we see these events that took place in the year 1755, 1780, and then 1833. But then the next thing the Bible speaks of, are events that happen right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's a huge gap in time. Because the second coming of Jesus Christ is a future event. Now, do you think God has left a gap in the history of his church as we move towards the close of the great controversy? 
Do you think God has left us in the dark? Go with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to Matthew chapter 24. Very familiar chapter in the Bible. Matthew, the 24th chapter, we're going to look at verse 29. Matthew chapter 24, looking at verse 29, the Bible tells us this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. Stop for a second. Did we see all those signs in Revelation chapter 6? Yay or nay? Yes. Okay, move forward now. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now look at the next verse. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth, please, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Open your Bibles now to the book of Mark. We're going to Mark. We're going to chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We're going to begin at the 24th verse now. Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 24, the Bible says this. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. Same signs we saw in Revelation chapter 6. Verse 26, now the Bible says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the uttermost part of earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. Am I correct? So ye and so likewise ye, when you shall see all these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Last one. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And this time we're going to begin at verse 25. Luke chapter 21. We're going to begin at verse 25. Most of you are familiar with this verse of scripture already. The Bible says, then... And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the sign of the Son of Man. Excuse me, am I correct? <laughs> And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption draweth nigh. Verse 29. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of yourselves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye. We shall see all these things come to pass. Know that the kingdom of God is now what? Nigh at hand. In Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21, we see all of the very same signs that are spoken of in the book of Revelation chapter 6. And every time we see these signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, the very next thing we see is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus always speaks of a parable concerning a fig tree. Even in Revelation chapter 6, when the Bible speaks of this great earthquake, the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair and the moon becoming as blood and the stars of heaven falling, it says that they fall to the earth even as a Fig tree, every time we see these signs in connection with the second coming of Jesus Christ, without fail, a fig tree is spoken of. Not once, not twice, not thrice, but four times, brothers and sisters. 
Now, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us himself, that upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. Now, when you have it three times, you know it's important. If you hear it four times, you better know exactly what Jesus is talking about. So now the question is, what does a fig tree stand as a symbol of in the Bible? Let's look at it. Let's go to the book of Luke. Let's go to chapter 13. In the book of Luke, chapter 13, we're going to begin at verse 1. Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. What we want to understand now is, what is a fig tree used as a symbol of in the word of God? Luke 13, beginning at verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him, meaning Jesus, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Think ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell ye nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or the eighteen upon whom the tower of Shalom fell and slew them all. Think ye that they were sinners above all that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and came and sought fruit thereon. And how much did he find? None. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking for fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig it about and dung it. And if it bear fruit, then well. But if not, then afterward thou shalt cut it down. Brothers and sisters, what was this fig tree a symbol of? Very clear. It was a symbol of Israel. It was a symbol of the people of God. And we know, according to the Bible, that the people of God always are God's church in the Bible. Is that true? If you're not clear on the fact that the children of Israel are God's church, let's just identify it very quickly from the Bible. Open your Bibles quickly with me to the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. We know it was a symbol of children of Israel. There's the children of Israel. There is no doubt in that. But I want you to see that God identifies the children of Israel, his people, as his church. We're looking at the book of Acts chapter 7, and we're going to begin at verse 37. Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. The Bible tells us, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. So the children of Israel, which were God's people, he identified as his church. And the people of God all throughout the ages have always constituted or made up God's church. So when we look back, turn your Bibles back there with me, please, to Luke chapter 13. When we look back at Luke chapter 13, and we see clearly that this fig tree was a symbol of the children of Israel. It was clearly a symbol of God's people. We can know that this fig tree was a symbol of the church. Notice that the owner of the vineyard said, These three years I come seeking for fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut the tree down. But... In response to that, the dresser of the vineyard says unto the Lord of the vineyard, hold on one second, let it alone for this year also. Now, how long does it take for a fig tree to bear fruit? Twelve months? How long? Twelve months? Doesn't take twelve months. That's not the growing season. It's only going to take half a year. Are you seeing what's going on here? So three and a half years were actually being allotted unto this fig tree. What is this talking about? You know exactly what it's talking about, don't you? If you open your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9, let's look at verse 27. In Daniel chapter 9, looking at verse 27, we see a prophecy concerning the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, speaking of the Messiah, the Bible says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? 
one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to do what? Cease. Now we know as students of the Bible that a day is equal to a year in Bible prophecy. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 34, and Numbers, excuse me, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, and Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible lets us know that a day is equal to a year in Bible prophecy. We are told that the Messiah will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in the midst of the week, meaning in three and a half days, or rather three and a half years, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Are we all together still? How long was the ministry of Jesus Christ before he went to the cross? Three and a half years. The Bible tells us that the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. The Bible makes it clear exactly what this event was, it was the cross. So what was going on here? What was the Bible speaking of in the book of Luke chapter 13? Three years as the Messiah was ministering unto the people of God. By the way, what did the owner of the vineyard want to see on the fig tree? What was he looking for? Fruit. For three years, here it is, Jesus is ministering unto his people. He's ministering unto the church. He is revealing, them, he's revealing unto them the truth. He's opening up the truth like they've never heard it before. He's removing the rubbish of man-made theories, man-made philosophy, and he is setting the truth in its true setting. He's healing, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's doing everything to possibly lead people to bear the fruit that God wanted them to bear, and yet they did not bear it. And then when the owner of the vineyard says, cut the tree down, the dresser of the vineyard says, no, let it alone this year also. Why? The prophecy must be fulfilled. Let it alone this year also, but if at the end of the year the fig tree bears no fruit, then we will do what? Cut it down. We will cut it down. What fruit do you think they were looking for on that tree? What fruit? Fruit of the Spirit? Praise the Lord. Galatians 5 verse 22, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Let's look at that. Let's look at two scriptures. Galatians 5 verse 22. I know you know them by heart already. But repetition deepens impression. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. What was the fruit that the owner of the vineyard wanted to see on the tree? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no Law, nothing to condemn a man that is revealing those characteristics in his life because he's living in harmony with God's immutable Ten Commandments. But what fruit was it that God wanted to see revealed in his church? I want to show you another scripture. Many of you mentioned it already. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 9 now. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to verse 9. What fruit was it that God wanted to see revealed from the fig tree. What fruit did he want to see the fig tree bearing? You said righteousness. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So he definitely wanted to see righteousness. He definitely, want, definitely wanted to see truth and goodness revealed in his church. But brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, there is one important fruit that the people of God had to manifest in their lives, had to reveal in their lives first before they could bear the fruit of righteousness. Go with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2. What was the fruit that the Messiah truly wanted to see revealed in the lives of his people? What was the fruit that the owner of the vineyard so earnestly was seeking to see manifest in the midst of his church. We're looking at the book of Matthew chapter 2. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 3. Forgive me, Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to begin at verse 7. If you're there, please let me know. Just say amen. amen. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to 
Come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Look at verse 10 now. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree which, therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit, bringeth not forth rather good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Look at what Jesus' first message was after he was baptized in 27 AD. We're looking at Matthew chapter 4 now and verse 17. The very first message that Jesus preached after his baptism in 27 AD. Here it is, verse 17 of Matthew chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at what was the fruit that he wanted to see? The fruit of repentance. Brothers and sisters, righteousness cannot be revealed before repentance. You see, the people thought they were righteous. The people thought they were right. They thought they were doing everything that to suggest them to God. That's why, that's why John said to them, and think not to say unto yourself, we have Abraham as our father. Because they thought they were righteous, but what God wanted to see was repentance. That's why Jesus, in the book of Luke chapter 13, I want you to see this with your own eyes. Open back to Luke chapter 13. That's why Jesus, prior to him giving this parable concerning the fig tree, in Luke chapter 13 and verse 6, his response to those individuals that came to him telling him about the account of the blood that Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices of those Galileans, his response to them was, do you think these Galileans were sinners above all the other Galileans? Listen, no, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. You think those that had the tower that fell on them in Shalom were sinners above everybody that lived in Jerusalem? I'm telling you, no, except you repent, you will as well perish. What did he want to see? Repentance. The message was clear repentance. He was searching and seeking for his people to reveal the fruit of repentance. Because until they revealed the fruit of repentance, they could never reveal the fruit of righteousness. And so he comes to them three years searching the tree, three years looking, nothing. Next year, he says, one more year, we're going to search the tree. We're going to thoroughly go through the tree. Brothers and sisters, do you see what was going on with the tree? God was investigating the tree. He was investigating that tree from the highest bow to the lowest bow. And after he investigated that tree, when its probationary period time ran out, what would happen to the tree? It would be cut off. It would be cut off. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to share with you is I believe with all of my heart that this fig tree is a symbol of the people of God under the investigating eye of God as he is searching for character. I want to show you this point one more time from the Bible. We're looking in the book of Matthew once again. Go with me in Matthew. Matthew chapter Go with me to Matthew. We're going to chapter, hold on, 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're looking at Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to begin now at verse 18. Matthew 21 and verse 18. As Jesus, shortly after his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, most of you are familiar with this, people had the palm branches, Hosanna in the highest. Everybody was lauding his praises. Look at verse 18 now, Matthew 21. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but what? Leaves only. And said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree grew, it withered away. Do you see what just happened? He's hungry. Jesus is hungry. He goes out, he sees this fig tree, and he thinks there must be fruit on this fig tree. Why does he think there's fruit on this fig tree? Because there's leaves on the tree. And if you know anything about fig trees, fig trees bear fruit before they bear leaves. 
So because he saw leaves on the tree, he said there must be fruit on this tree. He goes and he searches it from the highest bowl to the lowest, we're told in Christ Object Lessons. And what does he find? Nothing. What does he do? He curses the tree. He cuts the tree off after it was investigated. It had a form of godliness. Denied the power thereof. Brothers and sisters, the fig tree stands as a symbol of God's church under the investigating eye of God. Why is this important? I believe when we look in Revelations chapter 6, we will see that God has a message for us. And I want you to look back there with me quickly because there are two more important points that we need to bring out from the scriptures concerning this fig tree. Revelation chapter 6, we're going back now to verse 13. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 13. The Bible says this, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now I've come to the conclusion with you from the study of the word of God that the fig tree is a symbol of God's church. However, what is, a, what is wind a symbol of in the Bible? Strife and commotion. Let's look at one scripture quickly for that. Go with me to, quickly to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 40. Daniel, the 11th chapter, we're going to the 40th verse. Once again, that's Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. What is wind a symbol of in the Bible? Here the Bible says, And at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him, speaking of the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. Is that not a scene of strife? Do you see a scene of war? Do you see a scene of conflict? War, wind in the Bible can be a symbol of conflict, strife. Go with me now to the book of John. We're going to John, We're trying to find out what can wind stand as a symbol of in the Bible. We're going to the book of John now. We're going to chapter 3. John, the third chapter, we're going to begin at verse 7 now. We found out that wind can be a symbol of strife and commotion. We're looking at John chapter 3 now, beginning at verse 7. The Bible says, most of you already know this scripture by heart, and marvel not that I said, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, and canst now tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth. Even so is every one that is born of the Spirit. So, the operation of the Spirit of God upon the hearts of men is symbolized as the wind in the Bible as well. Let's go to one more scripture. Let's go to the book of Ephesians now. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to the 14th verse. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. What is wind a symbol of in the Bible? Strife, commotion, the work of the Spirit of God. What else does the Bible say? Ephesians 4 and verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to do what? Deceive. So wind in the Bible can stand as a symbol of doctrine. In this case, it is clearly false doctrine. But I clearly see from the Bible as well that wind not only symbolizes false doctrine in the Bible, but it can stand as a symbol of true doctrine. Why is that? The Bible tells us once again, if we looked back, we don't have to go back there, but you know it already, that the work of the Spirit of God upon the hearts of men to bring about this new birth experience is symbolized as the... Wind, amen? True? Let's go to another familiar scripture everyone here knows. Let's go to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to begin at, let's look at verse 21 for the sake of time. 2 Peter chapter 1, looking at verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. We all know this one. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of Man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the word of God, the holy scriptures, which we are reading right now, they came into existence as a result of the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Amen? But let, amen? 
Let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16 now, speaking of the same scriptures that were inspired by the Spirit of God. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. If you're there, say amen. Am I going too fast? I'm trying to keep a steady pace because I know you're tired. Stay awake with me. Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy 3.16. Are you there with me? The Bible tells us this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Hold on a second. So the Spirit of God that inspired the Word of God, we are told that those scriptures which we are reading now, they are profitable for doctrine. Amen? If we go on in the scripture, it says, For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So when the Spirit of God moves upon the hearts of men like wind, it introduces into their hearts that pure doctrine, that heavenly doctrine, to bring about the new birth experience. Are you seeing the point, brothers and sisters? So wind in the Bible can stand as a symbol of doctrine, false doctrine or true doctrine, depending on the context that it's used. But now, what does all of this mean to us? I want you to look at Revelation chapter 6 with me, and we're going to see it means something very important for us right now. Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to begin at verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, we are going to begin at verse 12, and I hope we've been paying attention because I'm going to ask you to remember some dates. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. The Bible says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. What year did that happen in? 1755. Amen. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood. What year did that happen in? 1780. Okay, let's, I'll start from the beginning again. There was a great earthquake. What year did that happen in? 1755. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. What year did that happen in? 1780. And brothers and sisters, I make no apologies for going over these things, rehearsing them, because I see when we go in the spirit of prophecy that when they had camp meetings like this in times of old, they came together to study the word of God so they could be rooted and grounded in the truth so that when we leave these convocations, we are ready to meet the world and to meet them with the truth and hidden in Jesus Christ. And so 1755, great earthquake. 1780, great dark day. Now, the stars of heaven fell, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. When did the stars of heaven fall? 1833. Now, the fig tree we found, perfect. The fig tree we found is a symbol of God's church under the investigating eye of God. Wind, we came to find out, is a symbol of strife and commotion, the work of the Spirit of God, as well as doctrine. Listen closely. In the year 1833, was there a mighty doctrine that came that began to shake the fig tree or began to shake God's church? And that mighty doctrine brought into view an investigative judgment. Brothers and sisters, in the year 1833, William Miller got his preaching credentials, and he was preaching the first angel's message of Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. That doctrine was mighty, it was powerful, it was shaking all of the established Christian churches at that time. No one was preaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ up until that time. It was such a mighty doctrine, but it didn't stop there. We are told that the second angel's message came in cooperation with the first angel's message, which was Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because you have made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 14 and verse 8. When that message began to go forward, it was powerful. It was rocking the established churches. We are told in the book Great Controversy that it caused a moral downfall to the churches in the United States of America, which they have never rebounded from and they will never rebound from. Powerful doctrine. And when that message was going out, brothers and sisters, it was causing all types of commotion. Then if that wasn't powerful enough, the day 
I don't remember the day, my brother. It was in the spring. If that wasn't powerful enough, then the midnight cry of Matthew chapter 25 was coupled with the first and second angel's message, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, brothers and sisters. It was so powerful a doctrine that people started coming out of the established churches because they knew that those churches were not going forward in the truth. They refused to move forward in the light that was shining brightly from the word of God. People were coming out of the Methodist church. Like, people were coming out of all of the established churches and they developed the Millerite movement. But when that doctrine finished shaking even the Millerite movement, it shook a group of 50,000 all the way down to 50. Now that is a mighty wind. That is a powerful doctrine. 50,000 to 50. That's a shaking of the fig tree. Unfortunately, I don't have the screen to show you some of the quotes that I would love to show you. But what I want to share with you, what I wanted to share with you was Ellen White's first vision from the book Early Writings. And in that first vision, she was shown in symbol the Advent movement, brothers and sisters, under the proclamation of the first, second angel's message and the midnight cry. And one of the most important things that I remember from that vision is that as she was looking around the world for the Advent people, her angel said unto her, look again and look a little higher. She looked left, she looked right, she looked north, she looked south. She could not find God's people in the world. The angel said, no, 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 you must look again, but look a little higher. She did not find God's people in this world. She found them on a path that was leading out of this world to glory. The message that God has delivered unto us as a church is to lead us in total separation from the things of this world. Total distinction from everything that is going on in this world. And I remember in that vision how she said some grew weary and said we thought we would have entered the, the city a long time ago. But as they, would become to, as they would begin to become discouraged, Jesus would raise his glorious right arm and light would come forward. And the people would say hallelujah as long as they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus and the bright light that was shining from the midnight cry. That was behind them. Their feet were safe on the path. You see, the more sure word of prophecy is what started them on this path that was leading them to Jesus. And as long as they held on to that more sure word of prophecy, and as long as they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, even when the path got harder, they would continue to move forward and they would ultimately make it into the kingdom. But then others said, it could not be the Lord that was leading us out this far. This far from where? Far from the world. How many in our ranks today are saying it can't be the it can't be God that's leading us out so far. Can't be God that's leading us to eat so differently. To dress so differently. To engage in such different recreation. I didn't even use the word entertainment. What do you mean God doesn't want us going out and tackling one another with rugby balls? I'm talking to you. Could you imagine Jesus with the disciples playing rugby? As, as, silly as, it, just as silly as the picture is in your mind, it's just as silly as heaven looks at you when you're doing it. It can't be God that's leading us out so far. So far from what? So far from the world. But brothers and sisters, I only have a few minutes left and I'm going to stick within my time frame. I want you to know something. When those messages first went, 
and it shook a group of 50,000 down to 50, it still didn't even go in all of its power. Do you know the second angel's message, when it was first proclaimed, it didn't even go in all the power of the Spirit of God? You can clearly see it from the Bible. Don't think, don't believe my words, but believe the word of God. Look at it. Revelation chapter 14, we're going to look at verse 7 first. Revelation chapter 14, we're going to look at verse 7 first. The Bible says in Revelation 14 and verse 7, you all know it by heart, so I'm just going to say it. Saying with a loud voice. Look at verse 9 now. And the third angel followed saying with a loud voice. Now look at verse 8. And the second angel followed, and another angel followed, saying, where's the loud voice? Where's the loud voice? There was no loud voice. The second angel's message, when it first went, it didn't even go with the loud voice. And yet, it was still powerful enough to develop a group of 50,000 and then help shake it down all the way to 50. Now, you tell me, what is that message going to do when it goes again in the full empowerment of the Spirit of God, as the Bible says it will in the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 and 2? Because the Bible tells us that that message to come out of Babylon is getting ready to go again. It has even begun. And it will swell into a loud cry, filled with the Spirit of God. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. Revelation 18, beginning at verse 1, the Bible tells us. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Look at verse 4. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. Brothers and sisters, when this message goes again in latter rain power, what do you think it's going to do to the church? It's going to shake it to its core. The message is even going now. But when it gets to a crescendo of a loud cry, it's going to shake this church to its core. How many Seventh-day Adventists do we have worldwide, worldwide right now? What is it? 17 million? Something like that? Brothers and sisters. If that message didn't even go in all of its power, it, it, it dwindled a group of 50,000 to 50. What do you think it's going to do to 17 million? That's when that starts looking like a large number. That's when 144,000 starts looking like a large number. You still want to debate about getting into a great multitude? Brothers and sisters, the only multitude we need to be trying to make sure that we get in is the one that Ellen White said we need to pray that we're a part of. Strive to be a part of the 144,000. We are living in a very critical hour. And it is my full belief that the same fruit that God was looking for then, he's looking for now. It's the fruit of repentance. As Laodicea we are proud. We think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Because we know the theory of truth, because we have the books containing the truth, because we are those that keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, in essence, we almost say we have Abraham as our father. Brothers and sisters, God does not care about the theory of truth. The everlasting gospel is the truth in practice. That's what God is looking for. The truth revealed in our daily experience. We must reveal the fruit of repentance now. And I praise God that we don't have to try to conjure it up in our own strength. God will give us his spirit that we can repent and be recipients of his righteousness. 
because just as Jesus was hungry then when he exited Jerusalem in those days of old, looking for fruit on the fig tree, we know Jesus is hungry now once again. Remember, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and if any man hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in and sup with him. He's hungry. He's hungry. Will we give the Lord of hosts what he is looking for? He wants the fruit of repentance. That's why he says to Laodicea, all that I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and that's the message for us. He's looking for the fruit. Will you give the master what he's looking for? The hours of probation are closing on us, and I thank the Lord that he loves us so much that he's extending our time of mercy. Brothers and sisters, as we continue here in these camp meetings, I know of a surety that the Lord is going to send us messages from Bible prophecy, things that will help us understand exactly what is going on and how close we are to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are things that are taking place right now that should have every last one of God's people sitting on the very edge of their seats. Nothing should keep us silent now. I had a wonderful discussion with my brother at, as we were eating lunch, and he was saying, we need to be sharing the message of truth now. Whatever means by which we can do so, if it's going knocking on doors, giving out leaflets, telling somebody, we need to be God's mouthpieces now to tell people that Jesus is coming. But we cannot be used of God until we repent so that we can receive his spirit. Because the Bible says, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then we will be his witnesses. May God help us as we are here to seek the face of our loving Savior, Jesus. That he might strengthen us to reveal the fruit of repentance. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for your tender dealings with us, for your patience and your long suffering. As your word says, if it were not for thy mercies, we would be consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. We thank you for opening, unto our up, opening up to our understanding that what you are so earnestly seeking to be revealed in our lives right now is the fruit of repentance. Please help us, Lord, not to be foolish and try to cover ourselves under a cloak of pride and self-righteousness. Remove all of this filthiness from our lives. Help us even this evening before we turn in tonight to find ourselves at our bedsides, on our knees, praying and asking you to do a special work in our lives. This is the reason that we came into this place. Not for food. Not just to hear some words. We've come to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, which you said is life eternal. Help us this day. Help us this night. To place our all upon the altar of sacrifice. That we might be covered with Christ's robe of righteousness. Thank you for hearing our prayers. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.